Okay, um, good afternoon and welcome to the Institute for Government. It's uh, brilliant <coughs> that so many of you have, uh, have managed to turn out on Monday lunchtime to talk about evidence and policy. Uh, last year, we ran a series of four events at the Institute for Government written up in our publication, Evidence and Evaluation in Policymaking, which looked at how government might better use evidence. And there have been some really interesting initiatives as a result of the Civil Service Reform Plan, uh, in particular establishing a network of what works centres on social policy. But at the same time, <coughs> uh, Nancy Cartwright and Jeremy Hardy were producing this book, which is in some senses a, uh, a sense check on the passion for uh, if it works here, it can work anywhere, I think, approach to the use of evidence. And they suggest some quite interesting <coughs> qualifications to, uh, to a rather unqualified belief that if you have one RCT, you can extrapolate uh, and apply that to the entire known universe and your policy will automatically uh, work just as intended. Um, I highly recommend the book. Um, whatever I have to say, the first part, which I think is probably Nancy's, is a bit more challenging than the second part. Um, <coughs> so anyway, evidence and evaluation making, evidence-based policy making. So it's an absolute pleasure that we have the two authors with us today. Um, we have on my far left, Nancy Cartwright. Nancy is Professor of Philosophy at the University of California in San Diego and Durham University, which must be quite sort of interesting, uh, interesting and unusual twinning, and was previously a Professor of Philosophy at LSE. Nancy's going to speak first. We then have Jeremy. Jeremy Hardy is an honorary fellow of Keble College, Oxford, and a fellow of King's College, London, uh, a vice president of the Royal Economic Society. It says also vice president. I'm not sure whether it's like being in an American bank where there are multiple <laughs> vice presidents or whether it's an incredibly unique thing. Unique, un uh, unique. Un 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 uh, <laughs> and also has a robust business background because he was chairman of the WH Smith Group from 1992 to 2010, Jeremy left and then they shut the WH Smith that I used to use on the corner of, uh, <laughs> corner of my street. So we'll take that up with him separately. So the format, you'll notice we don't have the sort of usual respondent. The format is going to be Nancy's going to speak, Jeremy's going to speak, uh, no, probably in total speak. for about half an hour. But then what we are anticipating is lively discussion and challenge from the audience and an interrogation of some of their <coughs> ideas on actually how can you really use evidence in practice. So that's what we're aiming for. We will finish dead on two, so you can all go back and apply the lessons you've learnt this lunchtime at your desks <laughs> later on. Just a reminder to all you civil servants out there, this is on the record. It is going to be on YouTube, so don't say anything that you don't want in the papers or don't <laughs> want your minister to see. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> without further ado, to like to hand over to Nancy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and, and thank you for so many people to come. Um, I'm not going to talk about the uh, limits of evidence-based policy, uh, but rather about how we can make good on some of the opportunities that evidence-based policy offers. And uh, of course, the setting is uh, that we are now in the UK setting up these uh, seven what work centers, uh, five new ones, and elevating the, um, the EEF to a what work center. Um, and this enterprise is costly. We know it's costly not only in money, but in effort and talent and, in a sense, optimism. I mean, if it, if it fails, we're going to be terrifically disappointed. Um, and we also are um, possibly uh, in danger of compromising the independence of the <coughs> SRC by urging them to uh, support the kind of research that these centers need. Um, and all of that just means to say that um, it's a costly endeavor, it's an exciting endeavor, and we should try hard to make good on this investment. Um, so what I want to talk today about is um, something I think we need to be doing at these what work centers. Okay. Now, let me start with what I think um, we already know how to do very well. Um, and I think Britain is a, a, a lead in this. I think NICE is probably uh, the best model in the world. So here, we, we that is the scientific and, uh, scientific and evidence based policy community, know how to do very well following established models like Campbell and Cochrane collaborations, the US Department of Education's <coughs> What Work Clearinghouse, and our own NICE. Um, we know how to do um, a number of things uh, already uh, very well. We know how to vet individual studies. 
to evaluate how good they are at establishing causal conclusions about the study populations. So that's one thing we know how to do. We're very good at reviewing evidence provided by studies, all the studies we can find, um, on various specific populations for what be can, can be concluded about the amalgam of these populations. And we're very good at making, this, uh, making public this information in relatively user-friendly ways. Okay. But now, that's what we, I mean, I think that's what we, after years of effort in the EBP community, I think that's what we've got hammered out to, to know how to do. Um, now, what I think the, um, so far, we do not know how to do well, um, I want to talk about, and unfortunately, um, it's exactly what uh, evidence users need. Um, so, we do not know what advice to give evidence users uh, about what to do with all this publicly available, reasonably readily accessible information. So, the canonical advice um, is use only policies that have strong evidence that they have worked in one or more study populations, if you possibly can. Right. Two, uh, make sure those study populations, though, uh, are sufficiently similar to your own. And three, stick faithfully to the policy protocol of the study since that's all that's been tested. I mean, and that's literally true. That's all that has been tested. Now, uh, sufficiently similar is um, the point of entry uh, I'd like our uh, new uh, centers to worry about. Uh, sufficiently similar is vague, okay? And it matters. It will not help just for the populations to be similar in superficial ways or in all the ways you can think of that might be relevant. Okay. Um, and even now, uh, we can do better than this vague, uh, this vague expression, sufficiently similar, uh, because we know what matters. What matters is that the populations must be similar in two precise ways, uh, which I'm not going to de describe in any detail. I just want to point out that they're, I mean, we actually have no, <laughs> uh, that they must have the same underlying causal structure, and they must have the same distribution of what Jeremy and I call helping or support factors. They're, uh, by social scientists, sometimes called moderator variables, and by economists, they're called interactive variables. But you have to have the same uh, underlying causal structure and um, the same distribution of these interacting uh, helping factors. Okay. Now, these two conditions are essentially necessary and sufficient. Okay. Um, that is, you will get the same results in your population as in the study population if and only if your population is like the study population in these ways. Now, I don't mean to be, you know, it has to be exactly, or I'm worried about precision. Um, you, there's no reason to think you're going to get anything like the same effect size um, without these two conditions being satisfied um, more or less well. Um, now, that's well known. Um, it's easy to prove, and it's proven in dozens and dozens of places uh, in different forms, but that's, that's what it turns out to be. Um, there's a, 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 you know, a, a, a represent a, a you can, you can see it in our book, but I mean, it's not that I've done, we've done this. I mean, this has been done for uh, decades. Um, so it, that's easy to prove. Um, but what I find interesting is um, even I've been looking at um, websites and um, guidebooks from um, a lot of the what works centers in the Anglophone world, and I don't find that um, even this non-vague advice is on offer to users. I mean, I don't see them say, look, here. <laughs> These are the conditions under which you can expect to get uh, fairly similar um, effect sizes in your population as in the study, pop as, in the, as we're reporting here, uh, the, the average from a meta-analysis, say. Um, and that seems uh, odd to me. And we can certainly, uh, in our centers, when we're <laughs> dispensing advice, uh, tell people that. Okay. Now, the problem, of course, is that um, that advice is not very helpful, I think, to users. And um, that's sort of what Jeremy and I got worried about. Uh, the advice is obviously very abstract. I mean, what is it to have the same causal structure and the same distribution of helping factors? And to follow it at all properly, just take scientific investigation. I mean, we do scientific investigation, careful, detailed, rigorous scientific investigation 
to figure out what works in these various places, in these study populations. We do you know, rigorous systematic reviews. Um, but um, we need, the, I mean, it, it, it essentially, if you want to have uh, a, a, a rigorous evidence-based policy, um, you, you need to have something like the same kind of scientific investigation um, um, of, of, of these, um, when the, about these other factors, how to cash them out in more concrete detail, uh, not these, this abstract characterization that you know, I, being a methodologist, uh, can give. Um, and um, that's not the kind of um, investigation that policy um, deliberators are in a position to take up. So one of my thoughts is that if we are um, pushing on the ESRC to do studies, um, one of the things they should be doing, we should be doing, is studies uh, about how to concretize this abstract advice um, and to do it in a systematic and um, based way, a principled way, um, rather than um, rather the way uh, Jeremy and I. Now, Jeremy and I offer some tips on things as a policy user that uh, people can do for themselves to get some handle on whether these two conditions are met in their, uh, in their own population, um, failing any proper scientific investigation of the matter. Um, and I think that people need advice like that. Um, and Jeremy and I, um, you know, we're just two, uh, <laughs> two beginners at this uh, field. Well, I've been doing methodology for a long time, and he's actually been making policy decisions um, uh, effective policy decisions for a long time. But you know, these are just two people with a little advice from some others like Gerrit Gigerenser. Now I think if the UK is going to make good on its investments in these new centers, this is an issue that we should be addressing with some urgency. So we need a, says me, we need a proper systematic concerted study to figure out what good advice to give real users to help them decide if they can expect the same kinds of results in their populations rather than the, I mean, there's a lot of good advice around, and I think there are actually people, as in NICE, who um, would be able to, I mean, actually use the advice very well, but um, that's not, I mean, you're an arbitrary user, now maybe a schoolmaster. We're going to have to have making decisions about what programs or policies to pursue in their schools. Um, we, need, you know, we, we need to be sure that the advice in our manuals about how to use the evidence that we've gathered and vetted um, is really sound and, and, and has a principal base. So I think we need, uh, we need to mount this kind of effort as part of the mandate for our new centers. Without it, we will not make good on huge investments in them. And in doing so, we would be taking a world lead on a problem that everyone now recognizes and is at the front of, um, of everyone's mind in the EVP community. Now, this isn't going, going to get us very far, though, because the two conditions that must be met if we are to achieve the same kinds of results when we implement our policies, um, as we've seen in the study populations, those two conditions uh, are, in my experience, rarely met, or even rarely, they're very often not even approximately met. Um, so even if you allow for a great deal of approximation, um, I think those two conditions just uh, often don't hold um, in the, all the little policy decisions I make in my life, moving back and forth between university in the UK and one in the US, or even um, moving around London universities um, trying to use certain policies about teaching philosophy, um, that the, the two conditions for exporting, the, um, the, a successful program that has a good effect size, you know, absolutely nailed down in a, an RCT, uh, it's, um, the two conditions just aren't met. So we get a lot of failures, um, and you can um, you can see that. I mean, this is shouldn't be surprising because when you look at good RCTs on policies, um, you very often find you only, almost always find quite a difference in effect sizes from one study population to another. Right? Um, so, uh, and those differences in effect sizes. Um, I mean, provably are due either uh, to differences in one or the other of these two underlying conditions or to, you know, a bad result. Okay. Um, so equally, I think we need a proper systematic concerted study to figure out um, how best to use the information um, to gather, how to use this information when the two conditions aren't satisfied. I mean, we've got a lot of wonderful, well, we're going to have a lot of wonderful, well-established information, which is really helpful if only we knew what to do with it. 
Uh, so it's not as if we have a lot of populations sitting around for which you can just export the results. And so then, what can you do with this information? And um, we know you can do things with it because, um, you know, if you, if you hire beforehand um, a good evaluator, I don't care whether they're a realist evaluator or something else, to sort of think through how the details of the policy are going to work, I think that they often produce, um, you know, a very good roadmap um, that takes into consideration the local situation and um, a lot of local knowledge. Um, and that's, they do so by using the knowledge we have available, but we don't know exactly, we don't have um, any sort of systematic study. What are they doing when they're doing that? How are they doing it well? Um, is there any way, uh, okay. So in this case, the problem is different from before because I don't think that the scientific and the EBP communities ourselves have any good articulated account to give. We don't have a good articulated account to give of how to use information um, that we have, the vast amount of information we have, including the information from RCTs and other very reliable studies, we don't know how to use this information for reliable prediction. People do use it for reliable prediction, <laughs> but you know, as a methodologist, I, I look around and there aren't any, I think, um, articulated accounts of uh, how, they, how to use it, and also particularly defensible ones. I mean, why is this a good way to use it? Um, so I have um, two, um, uh, two exhortations then, besides the ones I've made so far. Um, one is for the, um, the, these new centers and what we should be doing in them, and for the, in, particularly for the evidence-based policy communities and um, the scientific communities, as, you know, especially as we set the agenda for these new centers, Let's tackle these issues of how to make our hard-won scientific results usable um, with the same vigor and the same rigor as the previous EBP generation devoted to figuring out their evidence, um, their methods for evidence vetting and their methods for uh, publicizing, uh, systematizing and publicizing this evidence results. And then I will just close with uh, where does that leave policy deliberators in the meantime? Well, um, I mean, it leaves you in a kind of um, halfway position um, because it's important to appreciate what a significant tool for accurate prediction, um, what we have already, the properly vetted scientific results can provide. It's, a, it's just a wonderful tool, and you can do a lot better using the tool if you don't use it. But on the other hand, be cautious in your use of this tool um, because if you use it in too haphazard a way, uh, you'll just get the wrong results. Well, thank you. Nancy, thank you very much. That was. So I think it's quite a lot of challenge there, and I know there's some people here who've been very involved in the What Works centres, and we'll be uh, we'll be getting some reactions from you. But before we do that, we're going to go on to Nancy's other half, Jeremy, to uh, to compliment, or maybe. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Compliment with an E, Jeremy. Look, I'd, I'd just like to repeat what I think was said fairly clearly by Nancy, which is that we, although our book has been seen or might be seen as sort of anti-RCT and therefore anti-evidence-based policy, it, it certainly isn't. It's not anti-evidence, anti it's not anti-EBP or anti-BP and P, and we are in favour of all this stuff to do with the centres. Can we just get that? I mean, I've been slightly sort of wounded by Ben, ben Goldacre, who has got this very... S simple view of what we've been trying to say, which is, I think, just wrong. And I ha have also say that what we have to say is tentative. I mean, I think one thing that also came across from what Nancy was saying is that we need to do something extra now, next. There is a new step to be taken, but it's not absolutely clear, or not, it's, it's only clear in the vaguest outline what that might be. And just to borrow one of the, the name of one of the strategies which we mentioned in our book, as what you ought, how you ought to think about what's going on here and what might go on if you make an intervention. What um, I think we're talking about here is some sort of a pre-mortem exercise. That's to say, we're trying to think, if you are setting up these centres now and it, they're really well done, how in five years' time you might think that they haven't worked as well as you thought because you've missed certain, certain, certain important points. And um, the important points, if I can just, again, rather generally list them, are to do with issues such as professional judgment against rules, the role of the importance of individual cases rather than generalizations, and what you might call generally decentralization. I wanted to quote, to begin with, just two texts, one of which I think makes rather clear, clearly, the point that 
in the centres, it is recognised, must be recognised, that works here doesn't prove that it work, doesn't worked there, doesn't prove that it works here. This is the EEF. This average, and they're talking about the average result from an intervention as shown by an RCT or whatever, will not necessarily be the impact <coughs> of this approach in your school. Some of the approaches which are less effective on average might be effective in a new setting or if developed in a new way. Similarly, an approach which tends to be more effective on average may not work so well in a new context. However, we think that evidence of average impact elsewhere will be useful to schools in making a good bet on what might be valuable or may, may, may strike a note of caution when trying out something which has not worked so well in the past. And that is great. That is the list of caveats. That is the list which says, be careful here. Now, the trouble about the general injunction, be careful here, we, I used this uh, toy, toy example before. Sometimes you find driving, particularly on the continent in, 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 um, in, in mountainous territory, a sign which says, beware avalanches. <laughs> now, the thing about that sign is you don't know what to do. What they're saying is, there may be danger ahead. You think this is a nice, safe road. You think you're all fine. You think it's nice and light and that, you know, there's no ice and so on. But watch out, there may be avalanches. Do you stop? Do you put on a hard hat? Do you ring the avalanche centre to say, are there any avalanches? What are you meant to do? And although this is a much more sophisticated version of the beware avalanches uh, notice, it is a beware avalanches notice. It's saying, watch out. Don't please just take the results from the RCT or any other of the statistical, uh, statistical um, inquiries as being evident indication that you can continue to drive across the, along this road. And the other quote I want to make is from Ben Goldacre. We recognise that being a good doctor or teacher or manager isn't about robotically following the numerical output of randomised trials, nor is it about ignoring the evidence and following your hunches and personal experience instead. We do best by using the right combination of skills to get the best job done. That's true too. But the problem is we don't know what that last sentence means. We need to be a lot clearer about what it's meant to say. We need to do best by using the right combination of skills to get the best job done because everybody has moved on from thinking that the skill you have to have if you can describe it as a skill, is picking up the RCT and doing it here. And we know that isn't it. But what is it that you're meant to be doing? Well, again, at a high level of generalisation, I'm sorry, that's where we are. It, the, what you have to do, obviously, is to think about whether it, being the intervention, will work here. And I, at the moment, stick with the idea that you know what you mean by the intervention. Not clear, not clear, but suppose you do. You have to know, you have to decide whether it's going to work here by understanding how it's meant to work. That is to do with causal structures, some people call them causal mechanisms, but how does it work? How is it meant to work? And you consider that in the light of inter alia how it did work. And it may well be that one of the bits of evidence, one of the facts you've got about how it did work is something to do with the RCT, though it must, or at least what happened when you did the RCT, though it must be remembered that the RCT itself tells you nothing, precisely nothing, about how it worked. If you think you know how it worked, you may be right, but you got it from something other than the RCT. Now, a fundamental point, and certainly in my thinking, and I think in Nancy's, is that progress, that process of deciding what to do by thinking what the mechanism may be, what the relevant facts might be, and so on, is, a, is fundamentally, deep down, unavoidably, non-algorithmic. It cannot be rules-based. It must be that when you look at the situation, you have to decide how you think it works, you have to, in the light of how you think it works, try and see what the facts may be that will be relevant to discovering whether it will work here, if you like, what the, whether the essential ingredient of the success is, will, is or would be likely to be replicated here. And there is, no, there is, in principle, I believe, no rule book which is ever going to tell you that. It isn't that we haven't got good enough rule books, but deciding things, practical reason, is not like that. And if, we, if the word judgment is used or is allowed to be used, then judgment, again, is an un unfortunately very vague phrase which has got to be unpicked, and it's to do with being able to do that stuff better than pe other people. And that results from mysterious notions like experience and, and, and training, if you, which is, if you like, embodied institutionalised experience. Now, Nancy mentioned that um, in our book we put, put together a list of strategies which Nancy has thought up, other people have thought up, and I thought she was a little disparaging about them because I think some of them were rather good, particularly <laughs> hers. 
And they, and I will list them, they're in the book, they are notions such as causal pies, they are notions such as horizontal search, vertical search, pre-mortem, what I was mentioning earlier. If you're sure you're going to be right, just exercise your imagination and think about how in five years' time you will have turned out to have been wrong, what is it that will have, will have gone wrong. Thinking step by step and thinking backwards, it works by means of what and quick exit trees. And it follows, I think, from what I said earlier about the process of deciding being fundamentally non-algorithmic, non that these lists, lists like this, even the best list like that in the world, cannot add up to a manual, and by a manual I mean the kind of thing that you read if you're sensible when you've got a new bit of IT kit in order to make the new bit of IT kit work. You go through plod, plod, plod. It's not a checklist. It's not what, thank heavens, pilots go through rigorously before they decide they can fly the aeroplane, which is the 20 points. It's not what surgeons do before, during, or after a surgeon to make sure that they haven't left a pair of scissors inside. It's not the kind of thing where you suspend your judgment and simply do what the book says. You cannot produce a list, we say, which is going to enable you to mindlessly, without thinking, apply the rules in order to get to the right decision. The best list in the world, which will be longer and in other ways much better than our list, is not going to achieve that. But it must be remembered, of course, that as soon as you get away from the childish view of RCTs, which is all you've got to do is find one, and that tells you what works, and so you can make, you can make it work somewhere else. As long as you get away from that simple rule, then you aren't in a manual world either. You're not following a rule. You're saying, an RCT has given me an interesting fact. What am I going to do, it, do with it? And that, what am I going to do with it, is an inherently creative, imaginative, and non-algorithmic um, process. I think in all this there is m a bit of a muddle, certainly in popular discussion and maybe po political discussion, discussion about what a policy is. I suppose, though I'm not sure, that what's meant by policy or what should be meant by policy is that a policy is a generalization which is recommended or mandated that you follow. And the question then for the individual practitioner is what evidence do you need to, in order to be able to rely on such a generalization? And I think once you ditch the word policy and say what's coming out in all this stuff from the center is a series of generalizations. You, it will on the whole work if you ought to do this because it will probably work. As soon as you label these policy pronouncements generalizations, I think there is plainly a step to be made, which is does this generalization work for me in these circumstances? And here I think we do come across a th uh, something which in the, in the public debate is very important which is that practitioners generally, if you talk to teachers or doctors or social workers, it's plain that they see themselves above all as operating as a particular person with a particular pupil or child in a particular situation. And their task, when they're presented with a particular case, is not certainly to go to a manual, but it is to say, although it may not be so conscious or explicit, what generalizations can I rely on with a bit of luck, to be helpful in the circumstances in which I find myself. And um, we, it, this all matters, talking about individual cases and talking about context and talking about policy, because we need to understand what Ben's talk about a balance of skills could possibly mean. And it also matters because, for better or worse, professionals do think that their job is to apply their experience and judgment to particular pupils or to particular patients. They don't think that, that it is to follow the manual. And it's very important if these centers are to work, meaning have an effect which is overall probably on average beneficial, that it must not fail because it overclaims for the role of policy against individual and against, of rules against judgment. And that seems to me, in my pre-mortem mode, the anxiety that we all ought to have that this particular initiative degenerates into something which is not acceptable because professionals feel against it, and also it, it, it is not acceptable because it relies too much on the notion that generalizations are generally reliable. The final thing I would like to slightly tongue-in-cheek suggest is that I suppose that this business of having, I think it was four originally, now it's seven, it's growing a lot quickly, um, centers, is after all a policy. The policy is, the generalization is, that if you have a lot of centres with a lot of money spent on them 
and they're going to produce all this evidence and this is going to be used successfully to produce better results, then that ought to be evaluated and maybe it ought to be RCT'd. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, Jeremy, thank you very much. Some really sort of interesting, uh, interesting challenges there. I mean, for those of you that haven't read the book, it starts off with a couple of examples where things were slightly slavishly followed. Uh, I think there's an example of transferring a nutrition project in Tamil Nadu to Bangladesh and transferring Tennessee school reform into California. Uh, with the expectation that the very positive results derived in one location would be transferred and appear in the other one, and they actually got some of these fundamental premises wrong, they failed to understand the differences, didn't really replicate the things that were important, and not surprisingly, produced very disappointing results. Um, questions, challenges, comments from people in the room? And let's go... We'll go there, and we'll take a couple at the front. Yeah, can you wait for a mic? And then we'll come here. And tell us who you are. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, Cabinet Office. Thanks very much uh, for this and for the great speech and the presentation. Um, can, I, can I just confirm one thing and ask the question? The confirmation of the talk is about what Matt has particularly referred to as kind of let's move on in the next stage of evidence based policy, which would be about this question of residents, as referred to it in the book. Can I just confirm that sort of Okay, do you want to pick up those two and then we'll come, uh, we'll come here? Um, so, do I need a mic or is the one no, I no, have? No, no, you're the mic'd up. You've got one. Okay, um, right. well, uh, uh, randomized control trials, sorry, I need to stand up because I can't. Randomized control trials, um, I'm very happy to support. Um, they uh, provably, if done ideally, can <coughs> clinch a causal result. What they clinch is a causal result about the population in the study. Um, so um, we can nail that down uh, very well, how to do those. Um, we can also, well, um, I mean, think there is a bit of a trade-off because um, there are other methods that provably can clinch causal conclusions about study populations. Uh, Bayes-Nets methods, uh, Bayes-Nets Bayes -Nets causal methods can do that. Um, uh, certain kinds of econometric causal modeling can do that. Um, but you have to put in some more, uh, more substantive assumptions uh, into those uh, methods than you do with RZT. So I think there is a bit of a, a, a simple trade-off that um, those methods, the other methods that can provably clinch causal conclusions about populations, um, it's often easier to draw data which is closer to the target population uh, than, uh, than uh, with RCT. So we might... Um, when we really focus on how to move results, how to move what we know over to a target population, want to um, rethink some of the evidence hierarchies. I wasn't thinking about rethinking it in the way of, you know, that, that's been hammered out, whether um, observational studies, where they should go, uh, because these methods, um, Bayes-Nets methods and econometric methods and deduction from theory, some of these, um, they're not anywhere in those hierarchies. So that's, that's one uh, one, uh, one little thing. Um, and then, of course, there's this, all the standard things people talk about all the time, um, that um, some policies we're very interested in, um, it's very difficult to RCT, and if you're really interested in um, people having policies available to take up, um, and a range of policies that might 
work in their situations, again, you might want to go back and rethink how you're vetting evidence in the first place and see if there aren't better ways uh, to vet things like, I mean, I'm working on uh, with Jeremy Clark on um, possibly better ways to think of genuine, you know, evidencing one way or another about various talking therapies. It's quite interesting, actually, on that. We had a session last year as part of our evidence series with somebody from the Dutch Central Planning Bureau. Mm -hmm. They vet all the party political programs and give them a sort of evidence rating. And because mm -hmm. of that, they say nobody proposes system reform in the Netherlands because they can't give it. It's not amenable <laughs> to that sort of evidence. So it produces a bias in actually what political parties put forward in the Netherlands because of the sort of way in which they regard evidence. Jeremy, do you want to come on to this sort of uh, discretion point then? Yes, I wish I could answer that question. I mean, you say, have I written anything? And I'm trying to get <laughs> together a, a book at the moment, which is, it, it, it's, it's got the provisional unappealing title of Rules Versus Discretion, because that's actually what it's about. And um, I'm not sure it's to do with levels, actually, I, despite mm. your rather interesting mm. example about how you can't mm. suggest anything in, in, in the Netherlands unless you can show that it might work. In that case, in which case you can't actually propose anything interesting. Um, the, it, I'm not quite sure whether it's to do with levels. My confusion about this is that there are plainly cases where the last thing you want the person to do, including me and you, to use their intelligence and judgment. Um, and I, and I, I think the, 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 the airline pilot example is quite a good one. That's to say that if you have a really intelligent and experienced pilot, actually what you want them to do, above all, is to follow the checklist. Not to go in and say, I've flown these 747s all my life, nothing wrong with this one, and I'm going to go, you say, no, go through the list. Um, now, of course, there's just this niggling thing at the end, you say to yourself, but supposing he goes through the 20 and it's mm. all right, and he looks out of the window and says, I've flown a lot of 747s, I've never seen, a, I've never seen a, the end of a wing looking like that. So, you know, there still is the... These words are all hopeless, discretion, judgment and all that. There's, there's that stuff that is plainly around. So I think there is a terrible, difficult question about when is it that you say to people, just please follow the handbook, because if you don't follow the handbook, you're going to have a, a worse result than, um, than exercising... If you exercise your experience and judgment, you're going to do something worse than if you just follow, follow the judgment. And, of course, a thing that's never said in all this is there is some sort of idealised idea, and mm. a lot of the things that people like me say, which is, is all the people who are exercising this experience mm. and judgment are wonderful, intelligent, sensitive mm. and creative people. And that, they're not tired, mm. inexperienced or whatever. And there is a relationship between rules being mm. a good idea when the experience and judgment of the person involved isn't very good and experience and judgment being a good idea when the rules aren't very good. But sorting that out, I mean, when I've written the book, I will send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the other thing about the level, I think that... Um, if you take the other sort of paradigm example in our book of the, I mean, ludicrous with hindsight, ludicrous like all our mistakes mm. in hindsight, example of um, the small class size experiment in California, which is a classic, mm. it's a classic part because it's been beautifully and extensively and ruthlessly examined by right, right minded people. What went wrong there was really quite low level. I mean, nobody had the imagination, intelligent common sense or whatever to say that if you do it on a very large scale, very quickly, you, you won't be able to get enough good teachers. Mm. And the result is the average size, of, uh, average quality of the teachers mm. will go down and that you won't have enough rooms to do it in, to have the small classes in, and that will disrupt the general operation of, of, the, of the school. And therefore, the hoped for improvement in, um, although the magic ingredient was there, let's say, the, s the small class size, mm. it was overwhelmed by the the dishelping factors, you might call it in this particular case. Now, that, I think, is quite low level. And indeed, I think one ordinary thing to be said about this is um, that a lot of the things you have to do to think vertically or horizontally or whatever are only just opening up your mind. There's not some strange set of skills that very clever people or very well-trained people have got to have. They've got to say, somebody at the back of the... Mm. You, know, you know how it happens in these things? It's a groupthink problem. Mm. Everybody's very keen on this new exper experiment. The governor is very keen on it. They've got a lot of money. All the, all the parents want it. So, and you haven't got the courage to mm. say, wait a minute, if we do it quickly, we won't have enough classrooms. Because mm. you look like the party pooper. Um, and a lot of it <laughs> is to do with that. A lot of it is to do with that. OK, Clive. Kerry? Hi, Clive Bates. I, I uh, really like the formulation of this as a sort of, uh, in, or RCTs, as part of informing a bet on policy. I thought it was actually quite a sensible way of 
looking at it. But what it, what it sort of says is that you should treat any policy as a kind of live experiment that you evaluate and you're capable of stopping at the point where it looks as though it's going wrong. Um, but my, my second main point, really, is I think there's a, a bit of a danger in the way this might be interpreted. I'm sure it's not how you see it that it looks like a return to the primacy okay. of professional judgment. Yes. And, um, and, and I can see professional judgment being an important ingredient, but what kind of disciplines, constraints, challenges, um, how do you make the professional judgment side of this high quality? You know, what do you expect of professional judgment? Because awful things have been done in the name of professional judgment mm. throughout history. Mm. Yes. And um, particularly if you're old, you do remember why we embarked on all this, which is that you had wise civil servants mm -hmm. who probably went to an appropriate mm -hmm. university and probably got e an appropriate degree mm -hmm. and had, had been in the gymnasium mm -hmm. of the mind and so on. And they were able, weren't they, to make decisions on a wide range of subjects just because they were good at all, good at all the stuff. And that was called being unprofessional. And so b being professional became, in the end, among other things, looking at the evidence. Um, and you're absolutely right that it's by, th there's no accident that we've ended up with this EPP mm. stuff. And the reason we've ended up with this EPP stuff is the reasons are very, very good reasons. I think that um, I have to stick, unfortunately, with my self-imposed rule that this cannot be a a a algorithmic. So I don't think you are going to be able to set down a, a, a series of rules which tell you how to exercise judgment or whatever it may be. It, they will at the, best, at the best be a series of tips or whatever it may be. And I suspect the way that you discipline it is by um, people in a group. I mean, I, I, I think that there is a list of intellectual and similar qualities that you need to have to do this stuff properly, which include open-mindedness, willingness to change your mind, willingness to criticize other people and so on. And I'm, I, would I would like to think that the regime in which the notion of professional judgment was abused was one in which, which mm. there probably wasn't enough challenge. I don't think challenge can be systematically laid on but I, I do think the, 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 the forum in which you think about these things is probably the protection that... I mean, it may be unfair, but then, you know, because poor man, he mm. had a te there were terrible consequences. What he called Meadows, the man who yeah. did. Mm. Now, exactly. you, you only had... You see, you, you only had... Yes, no, I won't talk about him. But, uh, <laughs> yes. but there, there is a problem about authoritarian... Of people in authority, people wearing pinstrap suits mm. who've got knighthoods and so mm. on, which is that people tend to accept what they say. And there are reasons in courts why mm. you have to accept what they say. But I do think that, what you, uh, loosely speaking, healthy scepticism, and also terrible things like the way you assess whether a person's judgment is good or not, includes whether they're conceited or not, whether they're self-important, whether they're on the make. Now, all these qualities are not objective mm. qualities, but it's absolutely plain that if you're in a group of three or four people, and they've got a difficult decision to make, and somebody's putting forward a particular point of view which is based on what facts they think are relevant to the causal structure of this problem, if I can use that, you know, that language. One of the things you use in assessing their judgment on that, because it is judgment, because there are lots of forks in the process where there is no rule whether you go left or right, is to decide whether you trust this person's judgment. And that is to do with things, things partly to do with their character, and the other thing you do is you kick the tires, don't you? The way you decide these things is to keep saying, well, 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 supposing, how about this? Surely that can't be true, and so on. So I think you can generate some rules for confrontation, if I can put it that way, which reduce the chances that you will accept without further question what I say. So, Jeremy, if we're, if we're playing out policymaking quite dynamically, we've got one use of RCTs, which is it worked there, ergo it will might work here with yes. all your caveats from the end. Another one is, is I'm trying this out. My judgment is that this will work, but I don't know because we haven't done it before. And I think one of the things that certainly the Cabinet Office is promoting is in those circumstances using RCTs much more routinely to actually see whether the policy is having an effect because before we just sort of launched sure. something yep, onto yep, an unknown yep. world and then there will be a bit of a political battle over claiming whether it had an effect or it didn't. I mean, do you think RCTs are actually, should be used much more routinely to establish whether the policy you are implementing in that setting is having an effect? No. No. Or would you say, no, actually, that was a waste of government time, effort, and money. The NAO is about to produce a report, or may have produced it, I was trying to find out this morning, saying actually uh, government evaluations very few departments do them at all well. 
uh, you know, some are really methodologically flawed, those tend to produce bigger effects than the ones that aren't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, would the advice out of this be, actually, that's a bit of a bit of you know, chasing a chimera, don't, uh, don't really bother? Can, or I, is make, it can I make a remark on that? Yeah. Um, I think uh, my bet would be that uh, putting your eggs into, most of your eggs into the RCT basket mm. is just a mistake. Yeah. Um, that you do need to watch to see what's happening, um, but there are a great variety of ways of doing that, um, and a lot of them are more local and cheaper, and um, if you think that you're not learning very much unless you have the RCT, uh, which if it's going to be done well, um, mm. and it's going to properly evaluate the program, um, it's going to be very, very few of them are there aren't going to be very many you can do. Uh, I mean, for all the standard problems, like um, a lot of the policies that you want to implement will have effects. They'll have side effects. Mm. They'll have effects in the long term. You want to check as it's going along. Mm. And I mean, of course, if somebody comes up with a very good idea for how to do an RCT mm. that will do the job that's needed as the policy is going along, that's a great idea. Mm. But the, you know, to, to be kind of pre-committed so that's the way we have to do it, rather than um, you know, dozens and dozens of other ways of checking up, uh, which we should be developing, and I think thinking about more systematically. I'm a little more optimistic about systematic yeah. thinking than Jeremy. Okay, we've got loads of people <laughs> want to come in now, so that's brilliant. Let's go, let's take a clutch of three, and I think there's a sort of bit of a uh, okay? well, random Easter uh, <laughs> option in the back, <coughs> so uh, let's go, I don't know where the mic's gone, let's go to, Owen, oh, Kerry's there already. Owen, Caroline, and then we'll come forward. So we'll do a clutch of three. Yeah. Oh, hi, Tell I'm us Owen. who you are, even though I know who you are. I'm Owen Barder from the Centre for Global Development. So clearly this question of external validity, can you hear me? This question of external validity is extremely important. But it seems to me that this is primarily an empirical question. To what extent do um, the policy conclusions from one well-conducted experiment in one place then turn out to apply to a different population at a different time. We, your, your two conditions are, would be sufficient to guarantee that the same policy intervention will work somewhere else. But they're not necessary. Yeah, it's they, they're more or less necessary. Well, uh, Otherwise, I'd it's an accident. I mean, I well, it may not be an accident. It, it may yeah. be that some policies work well on different populations. Uh, and, and you don't solve this question by sitting around thinking about it. No, you no. solve this question by going out and finding out whether the same policies uh, the same interventions work in different communities or not. And what we found with the medical profession was they asserted at the outset that you couldn't, there was no point in doing clinical trials because everybody's different, all humans are different, all people are different, and there's no way that these clinical trials done with one population group would tell you anything about a, a, a different population at a different time. And it turned out they were wrong. They, they protected their professional judgment, but by and large they their skepticism turned out to be wrong. And it may be that there are lots of other professional groups. I work in development. They're utterly convinced that everybody's so different that you can't reach a sensible conclusion from one randomized control trial for another population. So far, they're turning out to be wrong. Um, yeah. I, I Should we go? We're going to go. Let's, let's get a few comments because we've got lots of people wanting to come in. Um, I'm Caroline Fines. And I do a bunch of things, actually. I work with IPA and JPAL who generate, uh, who run randomized trials in development. I'm also on a board of the Cochrane Collaboration. I thought Owen was going to ask something completely different, actually. <laughs> so you sort of asked the question I was going to ask. Um, but it, my question is really, Nancy, you talked about wanting to do a study to look at how we understand when and how experimental evidence can be applied. And I'm surprised by that, and I'm interested in what you think that study would comprise, because in medicine, say, you know, we don't do a study to understand whether and when a particular experiment can be applied. We do tons and tons of studies, and then we do a systematic review of them, or we do a meta-analysis of them. I'm uh, trained as a physicist, and the same is true in, in the so hard sciences, is that um, you know, ex external validity is a problem in the, or an issue, a, a feature of the a physical world too, right? You get different values of gravity in different places, and our job is to do tons and tons of experiments and to come up with generalizations that, that put underneath them. So, 
I'm, I'm interested in what, you, what the study that you mentioned would comprise and why you wouldn't get at that question by doing a compilation of a ton of experimental findings. Okay, and the lady here wants to come in on the same similar point, yeah? So we'll just come here and then we'll give you a chance to answer. Yeah. Thank you. Anne Mercott, SOAS, University of London. Um, I, I also wanted to pick up on a, a, a related point, your two necessary and sufficient conditions. And unless I misheard you, you uh, said that you we should push the ESRC to study how to concretize this advice. And I wondered, could you start to characterize what it would be that you'd need to include in the call for research that ESRC would have to put out? Because I'm absolutely at a loss, on the one hand, to understand what kind of either single or vast series of studies you have in mind, or alternatively, tend slightly to disagree with the previous questioner, um, because I think when it comes to the social as opposed to the natural world, then you do actually um, s uh, are often well advised to study how people use existing studies in the manner in which they make decisions. So I, I don't completely uh, see that that isn't a problem, but I do wonder how you would uh, write the call for research that you would like ESRC to do. Okay, would you like to come back on those? Is it just doing loads more experiments, which I think is sort of part of Owen and sort of Caroline's doing it, and actually how Could what would this look like? Could I just make a point yeah. about the first question? My slightly tongue-in-cheek remark at the very end was, I think, in the spirit of your... Of you, that it, uh, it, you say it's empirical. It is a, a matter of fact, meaning I suppose God knows whether, as, whether you do get a high success rate out of this or not. And one thing you ought to do is discover whether you get a high success rate out of this or not. Because you can have, you can have two extreme versions of all this, and I don't know how to choose between them, really except that neither extreme is quite right. One is you just follow these, a, lo a, lo a lot of the, the generalizations you get out of experiments are uh, really not very generaliz generalizable. So be very, very, very careful and use a lot of judgment. On the other hand, you don't go far wrong by accepting these generalizations as being really good bets. And at the end of the day, I'm not sure how much talking about it will actually get you to mm. r resolve mm. that or not. All I want to get on, 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 on I want to get this, this on, on its feet, these anxieties about discretion mm. and judgment and rules for two reasons. One is in order to specify a little bit more clearly than I can what the other end is. What is it you're doing when you're not accepting a generalization? Are you just being bloody minded? Mm. Are you just tossing? Are you being a <laughs> bloke in a pinstripe suit? I mean, mm. what is going on there? And the, the whole nature of that, I think, I think rem remains rather unclear. And the other thing is what you might call the practical political point. Mm. I think we do need to be clear about mm. the status of, 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 of judgment mm. and discretion, because we, a lot of us all believe in it. You know, there will be trouble <laughs> if, instead of being allowed to exercise our individual judgment in individual cases, somebody says, it's all right, the rules say. And I would like to understand very, very much better how doctors work. Because, of course, evidence-based policy is the paradigm, isn't it, of all this? And evidence-based policy, leaving aside you know, cracks about big mm. pharma and so on, uh, is to do with RCTs proving things work. And, I, I would just like to know the fit between that and what GPs do. Um, Nancy, do you want to come back on how yes. to concretize this sort of, you know, advice on advice and stuff well, like that? Well, can I start with that? Because um, one of the concretizations mm. has to do with um, a, an approach that's a different from yours um, that comes out of my um, background. In, uh, I began life, uh, first half of my career at Stanford, I was worked in physics experiments as a participant observers of philosopher of physics, having maths and physics background. Um, so uh, I, I don't think you just do uh, more and more RCTs. Uh, that's a kind of simple induction. Works in this population, worked in that one, worked in that one. Um, you could do, I mean, how many uh, samples do you have to have of white swans before you decide they're all white, right? Um, and these are necessary and roughly, I mean, they're sufficient in necessary conditions um, if uh, in the sense that if you get the same result somewhere else that has a totally different causal structure and different helping factors, that's just a total accident that it's the same result. There must be, I mean, if you think, <laughs> if there's something rational and rigorous about this process, it has to be that um, if the results in the experiments are having any uh, relevance to the new cases, that there's something going on right, uh, that, uh, you, that you don't know about. Uh, so one thing that, um, thinking about the gravity case, uh, uh, there you know what you're doing, right? You're measuring, you already have uh, the right theoretical concept and you know what 
specific uh, but how long thing you mentioned. Stop? How long did you stop? No, well, we did when we started doing that. Uh, at, uh, you know, <laughs> when we moved from, um, well, let's not talk about the history of uh, gravitational theory. Um, but I mean, one of the things that you, this got now moving on to the concretization. Um, one of the things that um, I think we can do if we want to um, try to understand what, um, what kinds of things generate these underlying causal structures for certain kinds of problems, what kinds of things are relevant to look for as markers of, of different kinds of underlying causal structures. Um, that's the kind of thing um, I, I, mean, I, I can make some stabs at it in a couple of cases, very local cases uh, that I know about. I mean, what does it mean to say um, these two situations have the same causal structure with respect to this problem? What, you know, wh how on earth, what do, what do we mean by a helping factor and how would we find it here? Um, I think you can do um, not just, you can do a mix of theoretical, empirical, and uh, method theoretical, empirical, and methodological studies sort of wound together. It's not like there's a particular empirical study um, that you can start doing. It's that we need to think through, um, among other things, you know, what, how, what this whole idea about uh, how do these results, how are the results we actually see generated by the interaction of the policy, interaction of policies with the underlying causal structure. How are, what are the appropriate methods for studying that? We have evolved um, new methods in the social sciences over the years, but if you go to the Methodology Institute at LSE, where I you know, taught, um, they, um, there isn't a method for how you do this. And it's not, it, I mean, it's just not, it, it, it's wrong to assume that this doesn't yield to the kind of mix of uh, theoretical, methodological, and empirical feeding back and forth studies that um, other issues have led to. I mean, after all, the idea that we start that randomized control trials, I mean, that whole methodology had to be worked out. We didn't do them 100 years ago. You know, ah, we've got a new wonderful idea. There are all sorts of experiments we do in physics that you couldn't have dreamed of, of, of you know, a very long time ago. Not so. Um, that's what I would like to see us doing is having a, 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 an, a, a, an attack mm. on this combined empirical, theoretical, methodological issue. Yeah, there's someone at the back who's really keen to come in, so yes. yes. Me? Oh, okay. yeah. uh, uh, you're talking about... Tell us, tell us who you uh, are. I'm, I'm Alex Kirkham, I'm a, a doctor. <laughs> um, you're, you're talking about lots of different structures for assessing generalizability, evidence, differentiating causality and association, things like that. And I like Jeremy's... Um, way of summing up a, a good way to go in that you should be skeptical and not afraid to challenge uh, authority or experienced people. But it seems to me that all you're talking about really is science and um, yeah. not fooling yourself. I mean, Richard Feynman, when he was asked to define what science was, he just said it's the best way of not fooling ourselves. Um, do you think that the people making these judgments, quoting randomized controlled trials, should have some scientific experience or scientific training, um, because that's probably the best way of being able to do this. Okay, let's hold that. And we've got a couple of questions here. Yeah. Hi, Amelia Peterson. Um, what kind of advice can be given uh, now that RCTs are moving more in towards <coughs> their social policy making about network effects and how we can understand their role in the underlying causal mechanisms? Because something we know about them is their s small differences in a, in, a, in a population can lead to quite large differences in outcomes um, when those are added in. And it seems like one of the big differences between the use of RCTs in something like medicine and the use of them in something like a school is that um, we see these very differential effects when there are different kinds of network effects going on. Okay, and next to you, yeah. Um, hi, Louise Thomas from Innovation Unit. We're actually the holders of one of the largest EEF grants for an RCT on project-based learning in schools, which is kind of a quite a complex, multi-layered type intervention. Um, and two major challenges we're facing with that, one being that um, the notion of what works kind of presupposes that there's a common sense of what it is that's actually a desirable outcome. Um, and one of the things that's being measured is literacy and numeracy scores in schools, whereas one of the reasons, many of the reasons schools would take up the interventions that we're looking at are often broader, less well easily managed, less easily um, measured 
kinds of outcomes for young people that is difficult to put a quantitative um, measure on. But the second um, challenge we're facing is that we know that schools do better at managing interventions when they are highly adapted to the context and history and conditions of that school. And yet we want to, we need to have some kind of fidelity and some sort of standardization of the approaches so that they can actually be looked at as a, as a whole across multiple settings. Um, so we are tending towards having the intervention measured rather than the practice. Because if we have to keep the event intervention the same, but the practice that schools do is actually highly differentiated, then we end up RCTing what we're doing rather than what the schools are doing. And I was wondering what advice you would give to people in that situation about what it is that would be the most replicable aspect of the RCT. If that's your mobile, because you switched it off. You said. Do you, want to, do you want to go with those, and then we'll do a final round of questions? Could I just yeah. say something first about the, about the first question? Um, I mean, I, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I subscribe to Nancy's mm. orthodoxy, which is that RCTs are very well done, or are, at least the, question, the problem may not be to do with whether RCTs are being done well, but with what you do with them in the end. So if, if the notion of scientific ed education was limited to facilitating doing um, better RCTs or whatever. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's the mm. point we're on. I mean, maybe we ought to be, but I don't think that is the point we're on. I think there's a, more, there's, a more, there's a wider question, which is whether people generally who are deciding social policy or are deciding mm. about particular social problems with individuals are mm. best served by having scientific training. And I'm afraid that, um, that must depend on whether scientific training is the most relevant thing for making those good decisions. I mean, there, must, there will be a lot of other things that are needed if you're making a good decision as a self social um, as a social welfare uh, practitioner mm -hmm. and um, I'm not sure that doing good science mm -hmm. would be the only or the main thing in the training program or well, maybe I've missed your point I see okay fine yeah it, it, yeah okay but then you do get into science and Nancy will talk about this I'm <laughs> sure uh, science assesses evidence in a, in a particular mm. way I think it's quite plain that in the social sciences which still remain don't they methodologically mm. the, um, the, 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 the the poor relation I'm not clear that we have assessment I think Nancy's point is, is precisely that in a way that um, that in, in order to discover how to assess evidence, you need a new program of what it is to assess evidence and decide what evidence is, is, um, is appropriate. And that cannot be done simply by following a thing called science. But I mustn't speak for you, Nancy. No. I think there is quite an interesting question about the extent to which civil service training, particularly for so-called generalists, actually gives them any sort of handle on how to, how to assess evidence. And there's quite a lot of tendency, I think, in the UK system, you may not agree, to use evidence in a sort of court of law way, which is, you know, we want to do that, and therefore I'm going to assemble the evidence that backs the idea we first thought of, which is the sort of more natural way that the civil service tends to, tends to amass its evidence to justify something that someone wanted to do, which is what some of this movement is, of course, trying to, trying to rein in by forcing people back to, back to what evidence yes, was no, going to be uh, very, very briefly, I mean, I do remember when it was a very good idea for ev civil servants to look. Economics didn't come mm. into the civil service mm. of education. And about 1964, economists started flooding into Whitehall, Whitehall mm. in order to improve mm. the e e economic literacy, mm. if that's right, or numeracy of civil servants. Question, did that do good or bad? I mean, because in a way, the suggestion that civil servants are too narrowly educated now mm. is, the same, is, is the same sort of suggestion. It's probably a separate session. Nancy, do you yeah. want to pick up some of these uh, interesting sort of points here, which I think were sort of quite interesting sort of oh. methodological potential problems? But I, th I think these are just the methodological problems that we don't have um, very good methodologies for dealing with, and that's why you're struggling, right? I mean, you, you don't have to struggle uh, to, <coughs> to learn how to do a quasi-experiment. And you don't have to struggle uh, to learn how to uh, do a regression. Uh, we teach you that in the Methodology Institute. Every social scientist can learn X, Y, and Z. Um, and so there are a number of um, methods uh, that we've got a handle on, and we have a very loose handle on how to do the, the how to study the kinds of um, interactive effects uh, that uh, that are troubling you. Um, and I. I actually think that we, I mean, I've got I've my own views about how one starts down that road of a methodology for that, but um, my views are just a, one 
person, right, who's been thinking about this problem with a, you know, a handful of people worried about it um, in practice like Lyman Monroe on child protection. Um, so I don't have anything to say. What I say is that um, the idea that we can't tackle this um, by thinking about it, ex having a program to think about it explicitly is a mistake. You know, I'd like to, it's just more or less your problem uh, that is the one I think we need to invest some effort in figuring out um, what's, what are the better and less better ways of approaching it. And, um, and okay. okay, let's have, two, I think. Let's have a last round <coughs> of questions. Let's come to the front here. We've got a couple of questions and I think one final one at the back. So. Hi, uh, Sam Sims, Institute for Government. Um, so mine's more of a response, really. <laughs> I just want to push back slightly on the idea that um, expert judgment is as kind of mysterious a concept as you mm -hmm. say it yep. might be. Yep. Um, so there's lots of work done, particularly by Eric Anders, on expert mm -hmm. performance mm -hmm. and expert judgment. Yep. And he studied things like chess, but also um, the decision-making of medical professionals. He finds over and over again that as long as people practice these skills in a very specific way, he calls it deliberate practice, they will come to uh, better judgments. And there have been reviews in this by uh, medical professionals. Is this the best way to teach doctors to come to judgments about things, um, which consistently show that it's actually very reliable. So in the same way that you could, if, it, if you had an invisible athlete, you couldn't observe their performance. But if you could observe their training regime and everything like that, you knew that was good. You could have a high degree of confidence that they would perform well. As long as you can observe the way that people are trained to make decisions, you can have more confidence that they will make better decisions. Mm. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. an interesting yes. comment. Is there any literature on that, Sam, since you've clearly been yes. reading literature on this? Is there any literature yeah. about better decisions by policymakers or politicians? Well, that's, you that know, that <laughs> the athlete <laughs> doctor thing is relatively simple. Not that I've come across, because one of the things you need for deliberate practice is the opportunity to repeat practicing yeah. it over and over yeah. again. Yeah. But uh, the Finnish special education teachers mm. use a kind of process for questioning each other's practice, which actually looks very similar to this idea of deliberate practice, and mm. they have the best special education teachers in the world. It's mm. actually the, the reason why their education yeah. system is so good. Okay, let's go along here. Yes. Well, the, the, the and tell us who you are. Late, Brunella Longo. I was wondering, uh, is there any case for asking less evidence-based policies uh, and more um, attention to overriding principles that yeah. should be I mean, considered when you start a new experiment, a new study. Like that. Okay, and right at the back then, final okay. word, Lawrence on the case carrots, right? Yes. Paul Hayes, then London, lo lo sorry, the Lon London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I just finished the 12 month stint in Whitehall. Uh, been, been very struck by the absence of politics from this discussion. Mm. So I've been very Speaking technocratic, oh, yeah. managerialist. My experience in 12 years is that the biggest, mm. the biggest barrier towards evidence-based policy making is where it conflicts with politics or ideology. Uh, and I think the, the idea that somehow the reason that evidence-based policy isn't given a free run is because of arcane concerns about RCTs <laughs> rather than the fact that the Daily Mail isn't going around. Or we didn't say we were going to do that in opposition. Yeah. So, so I, I think the, the, the reality is, unless there's a fit between the between the, the policy proposals that are offered and either the moral base of the politician who's being expected to act on them, or the political advantage of that same politician, doesn't matter how robust the evidence is. <coughs> doesn't matter to what extent the RCT is translated e even into effective policy on a national basis. The politics will take people elsewhere. Yeah, as you pause, Scoot, what was going to be my final question, yeah, which is when, uh, <laughs> which is going to be about actually how does the politics come in? So, Jeremy and Nancy, would you like to pick up those points there? You know, do we just need people who practice lots, lots, lots more, particularly on this? Should we, you know, go back to principles? Could I just say something and should about we play the politics about, as you're about the last one? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't think that uh, this is managerialist, it mm. is technocratic, and it is to do with how, if those other factors were, were absent, you would get decisions which were better. You're, you're perfectly right. It doesn't, evidence, facts, and so on, are not going to affect the behavior of people who are not willing to I I consider evidence and facts. And, and I still think there's a great deal of work to, work to be done, and has been done over the last 
20 years and will be done with the census and so on, in, in discovering what it is, what you mean by discovering facts that are true and, and, and that are relevant. If you then tell me there's a class of people called the Martians for whom this, these considerations are irrelevant, fine, let's not be governed by Martians, but I have no real <laughs> way of, 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 of contriving that. And on the, on the first point, absolutely right. I mean, I, I, mm. it, it, is per, it is perfectly true that when you look at material, Anders and so on material, what you get is insight into how it isn't just the fact, the evidence that um, tells you how, whether a person is going to perform well. It is what, what the person does with what facts and how they discover facts. And I agree that training is a cheater. Yes, absolutely. Do you don't think that sort of judgment, the sort of re-emphasizing judgment over some sort of objective stuff is actually going to sort of wave back into, because one person's judgment is another person's prejudice is another person's you know, ideology. Yes, but I think that's, uncertain, think, yeah. that's, that's uncertainty dressed up as being... Uh, I don't think... There are problems about uncertainty which are, are, mm. are famous out there to do yeah. with the future yeah. <laughs> and that there is no, there is no conceivable yeah. arrangement whereby you should be able to make judgments on the f future mm. that deal wholly satisfactorily with uncertainty. Mm. And, and there are going to be differences of opinion. There's no objective to be find, found. And, of course, the attraction of rules, where the, mm. of rules is that you believe you've got a checklist or set of blood generalizations which scores very, very, mm. very highly. So mm. you, you don't have to think. And, and the, you know, there is something silly about, usually something silly, about the pilot who says, I wouldn't do the checklist, old man. Mm. That disagreement is not an interesting disagreement. But if, as long as you've got uncertainty, mm. leaving aside differing values and what do you mean by education and so on, of course you're going to have different, differing opinions. But I don't think there's any trick, whether it's called evidence or anything else, mm. or confrontation or any, anything else, that's going to... Um, immunise us from the divisive effect of uncertainty. Mm. Nancy, last word. Well, that's right. I mean, the, the, you can have all the objective methods that you can actually show will produce reasonable mm. results, and um, those objective methods producing reasonable, uh, reasonably, provably, produ pr mm. you know, pr um, won't answer the questions you want. Mm. So you have to do something. Mm. And uh, you can pretend you're not relying on judgment. Mm. Um, you can flip a coin. Mm. Um, you, you can um, take something as if it was in the manual, but mm. th th there just isn't a, a manual for, for uh, doing this. Um, and I wasn't very clear about what, whether it was um, principles as in the sense of political, moral. Well, well, we are, well it feels like physical, the law. Mm. Yes. <laughs> when you do the sign the experiment, I mean, you can demonstrate everything mm. with evidence-based mm. methodology, but that's not the point, right? Well, it might be that some of the principles are um, in um, the kinds of things that one's concerned about in your program, mm. where um, the, um, we have general <laughs> principles in our society about what we'd like mm. to come out of the education. Um, and. Um, that you're having um, um, trouble seeing how those general principles are what's being tested uh, in the uh, in the experiment, and that's um, that again is uh, both a mix of um, needing empirical work, um, uh, but also needing theoretical uh, and uh, value-laden uh, work to see whether or not the um, the different outcomes you're measuring. Or, or rewarding, right, have anything to do with the, um, the general principles that you wanted uh, satisfied in the first place. And, and that, um, we need more effort on that. That's, I mean, that's all part of uh, a study of how, the next stage of study of how you use uh, evidence-based policy, how you use the evidence, because uh, it, it, before you start the studies, um, you've got this problem of what are you, what on earth are you going to measure to ensure that what you're doing is you're looking at things society cares about rather than, um, you know, kind of outcome measures that um, are putatively correlated with those but turn out not, not to be, and that giving up on, in a sense, giving up on your principles uh, for what you can, uh, what you can what you can measure and then what you can show you can do right well I mean, we can get a, um, 
you know, more students to have mm. passed five GCSEs. On the other hand, they don't actually seem to know anymore, I mean, if, if that were the case. I mean, you know that. Um, and so it's, I, I think, the keeping, how to keep the, um, the overarching social goals, the, the real social goals in mind, is, is a central mm. problem. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you all very much. When we did our work on, mm. uh, on policy making, which we published a couple of years ago for the Institute of Government, we said that we thought that there was an inadequate challenge to policies, why you get so many sort of quite poor standard policies coming out. And we actually proposed, Jeremy's going to forgive me, a checklist out there on the back of things. I, I like But checklists. actually, it's, uh, it's basically saying, you know, structure you your thinking and, and structure your thinking and dare to think about, you know, why actually are you going for this option rather than another one? Actually, why should I believe this might work in practice? Yes. And actually, I think one of the things that, uh, that Nancy and Jeremy's book does very well is give you some really interesting techniques for a bit of self-challenge. And... Uh, the Singaporean civil service, which is one of the leading civil services in the world, uh, has been experimenting, I think, with reverse post-mortems, sort of pre-mortem yeah. yep. things, which I think are a really interesting technique to get you to think the what, you know, what might be a problem with this policy. I think that's an incredibly helpful way of doing it. So very many thanks to Nancy and Jeremy for coming and no, talking, you, uh, talking through that. I hope you all found that very useful. Very many thanks to all of you yeah, for spending you. your lunchtime at the Institute yeah. for Government. We will be doing more in this space. We're sort of planning another event, I think, like to be sort of late August, um, which, uh, which we're doing. So keep a watch out for the invitations coming to more in this uh, series on evidence policy, better policy generally. And finish off with a round of applause for Jeremy and Nancy. <laughs>